I want to ask everyone here a question. Please raise your hand if you would recognize truth if it was presented in front of your own eyes. So do you consider yourself a rational person who is able to see truth? OK, I'm seeing some hands. People are a little bit self-skeptical. OK, um, hopefully a lot of rational people here, but I'm going to put you to the test. OK. <laughs> 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 okay, now a show of hands if you think the crowd in the picture on the right is larger. Okay. It seems fairly easy for you. How many people think the crowd on the left is larger? <laughs> um, okay, that was fairly easy. You got it all right. So it seems like you are fairly rational people. Um, and as most of you recognize, these pictures were taken eight years apart from almost exactly the same angle at President Barack Obama's presidential inauguration in 2009 and Donald Trump's inauguration just a few months ago. And as you can see from the crowds, um, the pictures here, the crowd was much larger at Barack Obama's inauguration than Donald Trump's. Nevertheless, Donald Trump took to Twitter, as he often does, to boast about the immense crowd. Um, he said this might be one of the biggest. It was a massive turnout. And the very next day, his press secretary, Sean Spicer, um, took pictures of the crowd in his very first press briefing on national TV and pointed out that this was, in fact, the largest audience to witness an inauguration period, both in person and around the globe. And so he was presenting what Kellyanne Conway, another member of the Trump White House, later called an alternative fact. So an alternative fact here is the idea that both facts are true. The crowd for Trump is larger, as is Obama's crowd. And so even when presented with the photographic evidence, as well as uh, ridership numbers in DC on that day, that contradicted this, um, she clung to this notion of alternative facts. And this struck many people as eerily familiar. And many people pointed to the similarities to George Orwell's famous book, 1984. And within days, the sales for 1984 shot up by 9,500%. It became a best-selling book for the first time in decades. <laughs> and perhaps the most striking parallel, to me anyways, was this quote from Orwell. The party told you to reject the evidence of your own eyes and ears. It was their final and most essential command. And this was the essence of the book, which is that a totalitarian government was asking people to deny their own eyes and ears and they were rewriting facts and presenting alternative reality to their citizens. Now, were Trump voters, or was Trump perhaps, denying the evidence presented in front of his own eyes? Well, they actually did a study on this. Um, uh, some researchers in the United States collected data from 1,388 American citizens and showed them this picture with the same simple question I asked you. They asked, which crowd is larger, looking at these two pictures? And like you, people found this remarkably easy. As you can see, accuracy for almost everybody in the study was close to 100%. People could easily tell which crowd was larger based on these two photos side by side. With one exception, about 15% of Donald Trump supporters seemed to reject the evidence presented to their own eyes. Um, exactly what Orwell was talking about. They said that the picture um, on the left was larger. And it, these were not labeled with Trump or Obama on them. They were just saying that that crowd looked larger, given the two photos and nothing else. Um, I just want to say here that liberals are not the only people to believe lies. There was an analysis done recently of uh, hyperpartisan websites online, and 40% uh, of stories in hyperpartisan conservative websites had lies in them. And uh, liberals were sharing stories with lies too. Almost 20% of the stories that liberals were seeing on these hyperpartisan websites um, were lies or had some lie in it. Um, thankfully, the mainstream media, which has been taking a lot of flack lately, was almost perfectly accurate. There was almost no lies in any of these stories that were detectable. This example about American politics might sound trivial, but the implications are much bigger than that. And this is what, to me, is much more troubling. We are having debates over basic facts about whether this globe that we live on is warming. We are having basic facts about things like the efficacy of vaccination. Does it help people? Does it cause autism? We are debating basic facts. And this has led Time Magazine recently to ask, is truth dead? 
If we're going to debate things that scientists have proven, if people are going to disagree with photographic evidence presented in their eyes, in front of their own eyes, have we lost sense of truth? Are we all postmodernists, as it were? Um, one of my favorite quotes was by a U.S. Senator, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who once said that everyone is entitled to his own opinion, but not his own facts. And that's critical because if we're ever going to resolve any of these problems, we have to first start with a shared understanding of what reality is. And then, if we accept that the globe is warming, we can debate how we're going to solve that problem. There's a lot of reasonable arguments about different strategies. But if we can never agree on the fact to begin with, we have no basis for even discussing how to solve it. Um, and that has led Stephen Colbert, a comedian, um, to note that it used to be that everyone was entitled to their own opinion, but not their own facts. But facts don't matter anymore. Perception is everything. And so what I'm here to talk to you today about is how our brains shape our perceptions of reality and then maybe offer some antidotes uh, for resolving that problem. This is one of my favorite cartoons. It's from The New Yorker. This is a famous perceptual illusion. Um, to some people, they see a duck. Other people see a rabbit. And these are two armies going to war over whether or not they accept their duck god or the rabbit god. And this might sound absurd. People are laughing. But that recently happened. How many people see this dress as <laughs> white and gold by show of hands? OK, about half of you. How many people see it as um, black and blue? I see it as black and blue. I see people looking at each other like, are you crazy? <laughs> like, what? what's going on here? Um, and that's exactly what happened. When this photograph was taken, it went viral. And people got in yelling matches, um, not only at the wedding where this was originally taken in Scotland, um, but online. People were yelling at each other about how they're idiots and fools and can't see reality, what's obviously true. I just led Ellen to post this tweet which she said, from this day on, the world will be divided into two people, the black and blue people and the white and gold people. And essentially, this is what happens when we don't agree on reality. It divides us. Now, where is this coming from? Why are we so divided on politics and on our interpretations of reality and truth? There's two good reasons for it. The first reason is that our biology is different. So there's more and more evidence emerging that uh, liberals and conservatives have different genetic foundations, that our biolog biological parents give us a certain genetic heritage that shapes how we interact with other people in the world, what policies we find acceptable. In essence, we're predisposed to believe certain things. And this has been followed up by recent research looking at the structural differences in the brains of liberals and conservatives. This work was done in England, and they also ran it with a couple uh, politicians. And they found that there are differences in core uh, structures in the brain between liberals and conservatives. And so what this suggests is that our brains are different. Another factor, the second factor, is that through evolution, our brains were carved to cooperate and coordinate as groups. Every single culture on Earth forms coalitions and groups and identifies with groups. And this was very successful for outcompeting other groups and outcompeting other species. But it leads to massive intergroup conflict. And so even though it's functional on the savanna, it is a disaster when it's applied to politics. And so when we think about how people are debating and seeing the facts behind certain issues, from inauguration crowds to global warming to vaccination, these insights can help us understand why people are seeing it differently and maybe give us some insights about how we can intervene. So if you're like me, the first thing you do in the morning is you roll over, I turn on my phone, and I check my favorite news sites. And what I'm doing there is that I'm seeing different news, different facts are reaching my mind that are probably different than my neighbor, because I select news sites that I enjoy. The other thing that happens is that I check my social media. And if you're not aware of this now, we are living in echo chambers. Our social media, because of our likes and dislikes, becomes carefully curated and becomes a reflection of our own values. And so you can go to the Wall Street Journal. They have this amazing website where you can select many, many political issues, like immigration. And you can see what a liberal and a conservative are seeing in their social media feeds at the exact same time, at that moment. And it is shocking how people are being fed different news sources. And so how are we going to agree if we're seeing radically different interpretations of reality? So that's already a massive problem. But the problem goes much deeper than that. Our brains are misinterpreting and processing information differently. And so we have these beautiful prefrontal cortices. And this is what differentiates us from every other primate on Earth. It's what allows us to build beautiful buildings like this, to organize events like this, to cooperate, to fly in airplanes. We have an enormous capacity that's given to us by our prefrontal cortices. But what they do 
when we're motivated, is reason in ways that can be detrimental. So although I'm sure all of you would agree that an educated citizenry is key to helping people see truth and learn how to distinguish fact from fiction, right? Well, that's wrong. There was a recent study that had people solve a math problem, and the solution either led to the conclusion that gun control was ineffective or that gun control was effective. And what happened was that liberals were able to solve the question pretty well, but only if it supported their belief system, only if it came to the conclusion that gun control was effective. When it wasn't effective, they failed badly. And this was true even of people who were very skilled at math. When conservatives did it, they found the exact opposite effect. And so what this study shows is that math skills and education and understanding might be thought to bring us closer together, but in fact, it can lead us further apart. When we're motivated, we reason in ways that support our initial belief systems. And this is one way that politics really does rot your brain. Um, there's also good evidence that we remember things differently. So many people, millions of people, continue to believe that there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. This is considered the greatest intelligence failure in history. Now, that led to a massive disaster, uh, hundreds of thousands of people being injured and displaced, uh, tens of thousands of people dying, uh, hundreds of thousands of people with psychological trauma to this day that are being treated. Um, but that's not just a conservative problem. There's a recent study by researchers who study how false memory, memories get implanted in people's brains. And what they found is that conservatives are far more likely to remember false memories that were consistent with their beliefs. Like the idea that George Bush was meeting with a celebrity when Hurricane Katrina was happening. Conservatives were more likely to remember that Barack Obama was meeting with the president of Iran, which didn't happen. They actually remembered it as being true. And so you can see people on the left and right are more likely to remember things that comport with their beliefs. To me, the most concerning thing is that it goes even deeper. There is some evidence that our politics might even shape our interpretations of basic facts and reality. So one of my favorite studies in this area presented people with a video of a protest and police were coming to arrest protesters, something that people here probably care a lot about, how, these, how protesters are treated. Well, in this case, they either told participants that these were anti-abortion protesters or not. And what they found is that liberals thought that the protesters were much more violent when they were described as anti-abortion protesters, and conservatives thought they were peaceful. And so these people were seeing the exact same video to their retina, to their perceptual system, and drawing opposite conclusions about what had happened here. And you can think of how this might impact how we all see the news. Even if we are reading the same news, watching the same channels, we're interpreting it through different lenses. Now, I'm going to hopefully <laughs> help you leave on a hopeful note. So imagine that you could give people an antidote to help them see clearly, to open their eyes. What would you do? I'm going to give you three pieces of advice that might help. The first one is that you have to consider the possibility that you're wrong, that you're misperceiving reality. As I've pointed out continuously here, everybody thinks they're seeing reality, even when we're not. This is known as naive realism. And so you first need to ch uh, check your facts to ensure that you're correct and that you're not the one misperceiving things. The second thing is that fact checks do work and people can reason effectively when they're presented with data. But it doesn't happen if they're presented with data from somebody they don't trust. And so the erosion of trust in the media is a huge problem because it means that people aren't going to accept the facts when they're presented to them from those sources. So you have to present it from a fact source that people actually trust. And third, you need to open people's minds. And what research suggests is the best, one of the best ways to do that is to listen to somebody's perspective and affirm their common humanity. Listening helps you understand why they believe what they do and potentially find a ground for uh, convincing them or correcting their misinterpretations, or maybe understanding that they have an alternative insight that you don't have. And affirming them is key to making them less defensive, because if people are defensive about their beliefs, which we know they are, they can react. And some people have even called this the backfire effect, where you present people with vaccination facts about how it's effective, they sometimes can even double down and harden their original beliefs. So you have to be very careful in how you approach people when you try to convince them of some truth. Now, this is just a first step for opening a dialogue and trying to talk to people and try to share a common sense of reality. But it's a critical first step, because if we're going to solve major issues like climate change, vaccination, globalization, uh, save our democracy, you need to start by having a common basis. Thank you very much.